Hello and welcome to another Mares and Stuff video. It's been a while. It's been like what? Two years? Afterglow? How many takes? You can you could rip into me if you want to. It's been like how many takes? Like twenty uh, takes to get to this point. And I'll be censored because we're on shit YouTube, so just put user imagination. Thank you. But yes, I'm joining my co host Afterglow here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Hold on. On the top, on the top. And then um, we have a guest here. Goes by the name of Smutty. What's up, Smutty? Hey, I'm only here to supply you guys with raw candy while you go through this truck of a story. That is very true. Mm -hmm. So the dream here is that we go through this story. And right now, this episode is mainly going to focus on you know a little bit of uh, facts as well as the intro, prologue, and chapter one. Afterwards, we'll split it up, maybe every three, four chapters, and then put a nice bow on top, have our final discussions. Hey, might even put this on the FOE board. Maybe you guys can ask some questions and stuff like that. We'll that sounds like a total disaster, but you know. You know what? That that thread is having a hard time staying alive the past couple of like weeks, going on like a month or two, so they need new content. Oh, yes. Yeah, All right, boys, I'm going to... I'm going to destroy our reputation with the board right now. All the people in the Fall of Questia threads either haven't read the story or haven't read it in 10 years and are blinded by nostalgia. How is that ruining the reputation if that's like kind of the truth, though? Because they're going to say, no, I, I read it last year. No, they didn't. Yeah. I mean, there are audiobooks out there. I, I've listened to it a few times to completion on those long hours when I used to work graveyard shifts, so it's it's not like it's not there. I'll include some links in the description of some um, official, like, dramatic readings or audiobooks or whatnot. So if you guys want to listen to it, you can pick your poison. I personally listen to the Craze Rambling um, fanfic reading. I, I just like his style, I guess. Like, at first, it takes him, like, a little bit to, like, adjust to the, to the writing as well as just, like, you know, the overall, like, just speaking role. But, uh... He does a pretty good job, at least in my opinion. I know Afterglow, you've you've linked like the official like audiobook in here as well, right? Yes, because uh, audiobook is better when it's a female voice reading it. And don't worry, it'll get original music when the full remastered version releases in 2034. That that sounds like a plan. I mean, right before we 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 dive into that, does the immersion of the story being um, read by either a male or female really matter? It depends. It really depends on the story. Mm -hmm. I mean, she does every single voice for all the characters, so she's kind of bad at some of them. Oh, for fuck. They changed it to one male voice. No, there's not even a single male voice. Male, vo male voice. There will be in the remaster that'll totally come out, we swear. Totally come out. Please, please don't take away your, your Patreon support. <laughs> wait, wait, they're still taking Patreon support? I don't know, I'm just yelling that out. No. Oh, no. Okay, well, no, it, it, it's non-for-profit. All the money you give it goes to the doctors for the prevention of nuclear war. Interesting. Serious. Seriously. It's pretty funny. Well, KCAT didn't want them to make money off it, so they didn't. Well, okay, that's another thing, too, before we, like, jump into this. Just real quick. So, KCAT. Um, what's the controversy on that afterglow? I know you have something to say about that. What's what's the controversy on the author? Let's let's talk about the author a little bit. All I know is that they apparently pretended to be a girl to make people read their story when it first came out. Interesting. What about you, Smuddy? I think you had something to say too before, or or that was the only thing that you know about. Um, I, I don't know if I should say this because I know you wanted to keep this PG thirteen, but um, that. Pretending to be a girl thing kind of um, let this up in a few years down the line. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, and it's just, it's kind of fucking weird because, you know, the whole how he writes the, you know, Pip and other girl characters and the whole lesbian relationship thing. Yeah. Mm. Very interesting. Really makes you think. Mm -hmm. I mean, just just like I said, talking about the overall story, what is just 
one thing that grinds your gears when you think about it? I mean, I'm probably going to ask the same question maybe in the middle as well as even in the end because I personally have to um, re re-listen to the story because I think I the last time I listened to the whole thing was about four or five months ago, so I might have to like re-listen to the whole thing again just to like, you know, completely have a refresher. But if you can name out just one thing, and again, this can change if you guys want, that grinds your gears, what would that one thing be after Glow? Velvet Remedy. That's it. That, you know, I agree. <laughs> Smutty, what about you? I know you haven't read it, but I know you heard of it. What is one thing? I've, I've, I've read it a long time ago to the point where I will be honest and be truthful with you, but I would need to fucking reread a lot of the chapters to remember it. But I just remember it just... It, it, it had the classic main character syndrome where all the main choices had to be done only by the main character and only her. It couldn't like be a functioning world where other choices are being made by her character. No, it, al it always has to be from her, which is always a bad writing decision if it's just me. You have very good points, both of you. I mean, Velvet Remini is just really annoying, I would say. Um... Just to piggyback off of that, not to go into too much detail, but they're way too optimistic for the world that they like step into. And we'll 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 jump into that, but that I will just say that as a little hint. And then Smutty, yeah, you're right. Like I don't like it. I mean, it's not really much of a spoiler because let's be honest. Like most main characters tend to be the leader no matter what, but I hate that trope too of like. The main character is oh they're they're younger and they're the leader all of a sudden because oh they're the main character it's like there weren't many moments again not to go into spoilers but there weren't many like learning moments where they actually you know learn things go over you know some adversities that have real consequences and those you know moments of learning impact the story like immensely like i could be eating my words in like the next couple of videos maybe there were and that's what you know again re-listen to the story but from my memory there just wasn't those like you know moments like that like not to get too much spoilers but one thing I... that grinds my gears and I'll, I'll let you go right now is the stupid mouth guns that grinds my gears first of all when the fucking recall of the, some of them like just knock their fucking teeth out <laughs> that's it would that's what I would think. I mean, I just don't understand that. Like, Why I, would they not make Earth Ponies just melee fighters? Come on. Exactly. Like, maybe in this timeline, like, they have a better natural resistance against magic, so, you know, they don't have to worry about it too much. Maybe they have, like, additional endurance and strength, like, you know, like, the show itself, you know, all that kind of stuff, but it just, I don't like it. It's lazy. It's lazy. And I think the writing, and again, not to go into too much spoilers, but making the character being able to use magic, I think that's just like the the biggest crutch for a lot of these characters. Because we could talk about Vanilla Fallout, we could talk about Project Horizons Fallout, we could talk about the the one I'm listening to currently, um, Project Horizon. Not sorry, not not just Project Horizons, but um, Fallout Equestria, uh, the Chrysalis. And again, the character has magic. So I'm just like, this is just the most, you know, crutch a lot of these writers like to use because they can't really invent new ways to have their characters, you know, move from point A to point B because it's like, you know, we think in that perspective, like, oh, we have to open doors. We have to, like, you know, hack into computers, this and that when we're, when we're playing an actual, like, Fallout game. So, yeah, I'm going to shut up now because I've been talking for a little too long. I'm going to pass the mic to you, Africo. Please say something more than, like, a one minute. What are your thoughts about the intro and prologue together? And then from there, we'll move on to chapter one. Introduction, literally pointless. You don't need it. I already know the world's ended. It's fucking Fallout. And the prologue just explains to it basically Fallout stuff. Which you probably could have figured out on your own just from reading the regular story. So they're both pointless. You can start from chapter one and miss nothing. It's a good start. Little Pip has a fat ass, though. That's about it. I was going to ask, 
Just a side note. Is it true that we only get like one or two of our physical features and like everything we see that's art is just artist interpretation? Because I just, it, again, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they only mention her having brown hair and green eyes and everything else is just kind of guessed in the terms of like physical appearance. Oh, oh, of course, and she's she's shorter too. But other than that, like those are the only three things that I remember. <laughs> The thing is, probably the very first artist made their interpretation of what she looked like, and then every other artist just followed that one's interpretation. That just became the canon look of her, probably. Yeah, I have no clue. It's not very well detailed. That's probably how it went. It was just the very first artist who did like the most, I guess, work of her, and then everyone else just followed that exact look, and that's become the textbook for her. Yeah, you know, that that could be a thing. Um, it kind of leads on to the next question, you know, because as you said, like, oh, maybe the first artist or like after that, like other people just like, oh, this is what she looks like. So we'll just draw her like this. Um, I would love to do some research and see if we can go as far back as possible to see what the art is. Unfortunately, like so much has been lost, <laughs> kind of mirroring our own world and also just the fallout world that just so much has been lost that it's going to be kind of hard to like pinpoint all this stuff because let's be honest like a lot of stuff has been moved around like yeah there's the archives and stuff but as we're gonna um, dive into the story a little bit more um this story started off on google docs first and it was being shared around i'm sure somebody must have like you know posted it on on fanfic.net and then eventually it moved on to fanfic.net um, in 20, was it 2013? Yeah, 2013. And even the author was, was posting it in parts. So, you know, they can have people like actively discussing it and whatnot. Um, of course, later on, it found its way onto, uh, you know, slash MLP. But uh, other than that, though, I mean, it's, it's going to be kind of hard to like pinpoint that. So if there's any, any uh, archivist that can point us into the right direction, it'd be much appreciated. But um, yeah, kind of I was going to ask the question, what's your uh, answer here, Afterglow, if this story was released three to five years ago? Do you think it would have been as popular as any other story of this length, of this magnitude? Nope, lightning in a bottle. They got extremely lucky. What about you, Smuddy? Literally the exact same thing. It was the very it became popular because it was the concept itself that made it popular. Because it, I'm imagine it was done before, but none were of this length. So it, so obviously it immediately caught on for the time. So probably not now. No. Yeah, I just find it interesting that there's like an entire like even subset of the fandom that just revolves around FOE. Like, there's just some people that that's all they know is just FOE. There was also a time where I believe, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, mm -hmm. some people in Bethesda, some of the workers there, some of the programmers and stuff that are working on the Fallout games, actually found out about the story. <laughs> and according to the legend, not sure if it's, like, completely true, but that's why you have, like, references to, like, MLP in... Um, some of the voice lines in uh, Fallout 4 later on, also with the uh, with the toy too. So they say that's why because they 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 found out about it because it was so popular at the time. And you know, a lot of places once they find out there's something super popular, they try to like reference it. You know, kind of similar to like Chris Chan stuff with the whole like Sonic shoe. Like some of the people at 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 Sega like don't know the, the whole story of Chris Chan, but they know of Sonic shoe. So, kind of a little side note there. You want to say something, Afterglow? Uh, no. Okay. It's very, it's very unfortunate those MLP references had to be made in fucking Fallout Four, but that's a different story. Yeah, too. That's a, that's totally at least it's not seventy six. That's also true. Yeah, I mean, what you said earlier. Uh, I also believe too that like if the story was was released now it probably wouldn't have been as popular not just because of the whole like size of the fandom and whatnot but it's just the writing itself of the first story we could go down the list here but me personally six out of ten six and a half out of ten if i'm being generous 
what about you, Afterglow? What do you, what do you like rate the writing and like maybe say some things about it? Like, what would you rate it as? Four out of ten. Mary Sue, main character. Because later on, every time she goes to any town, they point in and go, hey, that's you. That's the late bringer where we fuck. How neat. What about you, Spunny? Five out of ten. Same exact reasons. But probably a little bit more technical. It's going to be interesting having like a writer's perspective in here. That's something I think... Mind you, a very amateur writer, but yeah. I mean, that's better than... Also a fit writer. I mean, that's better than like other people that have done these reviews where like they're not even writers. They're just internet personalities. I would hope that they have some writer, you know, prior knowledge, but you know, let, let's not go into that. Um, did we go over what grinds your gears, or we already did that? We did. Okay, cool. like five minutes ago. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. So, chapter one itself, right? Chapter one. I will admit, as much as okay, I'm gonna say this before we get started. I'm the host enclave, and I like this story. You know, I, I, I see it through the rose-tinted glasses that is nostalgia. I like it. You know, it has its moments, and it sucks, but I have to acknowledge that it did have an impact in the fandom. Yeah. Smutty is... What, what do you think about it? Are you indifferent? Do you like it? Do you hate it? Like, what, what do you feel about it before we dive into this? What do you mean to be specific? Do you like the story? Do you don't really care about it? You know, do you just appreciate that? Oh, this thing's you know created its own like sub faction of the fandom. Like, what are your like just just your I, feelings? Towards I understand. I understand its importance to the fandom, but I personally just don't like it that much for the reasons that you've given earlier. I feel like if we just did a complete like redo of this, it might be something I'd be very passionate about. Really. That I could see myself like dumping hours on, you know, just disgusting theories and such. But as is, no, not really. But I understand the, the like the importance of it. Yeah. Okay. And then my co-host Afterglow, he doesn't like it. You mind telling me why you don't like it? Just, just like a quick little, uh, give me some pointers why, like without going too much into detail. Man. I hate that it instantly sets up the little pip is going to simp for Velvet for like 99% of the story. Because funny hot lesbian man. We gotta have our main character be gay. Force the lesbian thing way, way sooner than a lot of people did. So, so yeah, I give him credit for that, I guess. And Velvet's plan is stupid. Let me leave the password to the, the vault in my pit bug instead of deleting it while giving it to the person that's an expert in pit bug. He won't find it. Oh, person, I meant pony. I'm not K-Cat, I swear. He swears, guys, he swears. Yeah. I would say, um, chapter one sets up basically as chapter, uh, sorry. Chapter one sets up basically as the intro of Fallout 3. And it's very obvious that KCAT did not play any of the previous titles. Maybe read some things here and there in order to help them write about their story, but it, it clearly shows that they didn't actually play the game. So it just sets up as like that, like, oh. And again, spoilers, yes or no, but Fallout 3 has been, what, out for the past, like, 10 plus years or something? It's been more than 10 fucking years. It's been way more than that. Like 2006. Well, anyways, it's the same freaking story of, like, the whole fault, like, Bethesda formula of, like, oh, you're a vault dweller, but someone very important to you, i.e. your mom, dad, or some other person decides to venture out and, like, you gotta go find them, and, you know, while you're exploring, you're gonna find, like, the, some harsh truths about the world and how things aren't really the the, the way they're supposed to, etc., etc. It literally, like, does the same setup, and I hate it. 
So and bro, that bro, that to New Vegas, where you're a powerful, albeit just nobody, who just ends up becoming a very important like piece for whatever faction he decides to go with. Yeah, I just to I guess gripe on that a bit. Um, I don't like New Vegas. I know I, we're gonna get some people like just having riots in the streets. I don't know why people worship New Vegas for what it is. Don't get me wrong; it is a solid story. It's really like well written but it's hard to experience the story when your game crashes every five minutes i know there's patches and whatnot but you know you don't (laughs) you shouldn't need to have massive mod overhauls to just have the game be playable but we all know bethesda's trash and they screwed over Obsidian so many times while making Fallout New Vegas, so I can't really bash them too hard about that. But at least for the sake of this story, it seemed like they took Fallout 3 like a little bit too much on the nose when it came to this like character and like oh they're very important and this and that this and that like and they're and they're 100 percent going to be the savior of the wasteland. <laughs> yeah, and, and and that's just another thing I. It would be interesting. I mean, again, red pill me. Maybe, maybe I, I don't know, but it would be interesting for someone to do like a villain for once, you know. Well, while, while they're out there, they're just probably just not as well known because, let's be honest, like most people don't want to. Unfortunately, most people don't want to see a ambiguous like main character. Not even a villain, just morally ambiguous. They want to see that. They want to see a pure cut hero, which I find per- pretty boring personally. But you know. Oh no, I agree. I'm surprised. Okay, yeah, we'll we'll get to that if we ever truly get to that behemoth. But um, yeah, that's that's basically chapter one. It just sets everything up. I mean, little Pip is like gray. The walls are gray. I wish someone would paint something on my walls. Which I understand what the writer's trying to do, like, you know, try to put us, you know, in the position of what of what the character's experiencing, but I don't like it. I feel like, I feel like they could have, I feel like he could have written the Menominee, or where the fuck you, how you say it, of her life a bit better. Maybe have her, like, maybe have it so that she repeats the task she does over and over again for, like, a few, you know maybe like a paragraph or two so you know to maybe just show how she's just going through the loops of her boring repetitive life but that's just a suggestion yeah i mean that, that's yeah, a yeah. good point go ahead sorry uh, after a little. yeah there's there's like no time to set up the stable but we get to see the overmare like twice in the whole chapter like we learn about how nothing really about how it functions mm-hmm. and yeah i mean for a lot of people in the fandom that that was their introduction to fallout you know a lot of i've I've met plenty of people that said like oh yeah like you know foe was my introduction to like playing the fallout games i cannot imagine foe being my fucking introduction to fallout well <laughs> if you, to call to I, think, New Vegas. I think yeah i think um it's either the something awful or even slash v a lot of people they say that they um read the story because they said like oh how popular it was um some yeah very few people read it to its completion but some people just wanted like glance over it just to like okay why is it so popular but it's interesting enough to see how far they they went in because they actually do tear it apart in the sense of like of the source material they borrowed and and you know they they borrowed from which again i think we mentioned that before but it mainly borrows from fallout 3 and bits and pieces of the of the of the, of the original game so, you know, they tried, but it feels like they're just, you know, <laughs> they they just, you know, read read a couple things or watched a couple like YouTube videos about the basics of the of the world and the basics of these characters, and then they just copied and pasted, it, you know, the very minimum stuff, and voila, you have your villains, you have your locations, and this and that. I feel like the story itself is also rushed, but we'll get into that a little bit later. But yeah, I mean, there you go. I mean, that's that's chapter one. Usual wait, setup, stable. What's up? Wait, just right now. You said it, you feel like it was a rush. So, do you think Kit Kat was gonna plan? You know, okay, Pip's gonna do this. Pip's gonna do this. Pip's gonna do this. Or do you think he was just going on the fly? I, that's my question for you. 
I want to say that they were riding this because they saw a wave to ride on. They try to ride the momentum, and I think that's what makes a lot of the, the parts of the overall story a bit awkward. Um, not just the riding itself, but like, why are they in location A when they haven't really fully explored location B yet, or even you know why are they talking about this when you know there's this other thing that's really important right in front of them you know they're just kind of like rushing through it even the whole villains thing like the villains it feels like you're you're re-watching the amazing spider-man movies for those that haven't watched it or really not haven't heard of it you know the ones with the andrew garfield um actor playing spider-man it, his you know this <laughs> just real quick uh, really cool uh concepts they did really athletic uh spider-man you know really captured the whole like he's you know really athletic could jump around acrobatic etc cetera, etc cetera. really captures that however when you're given a bad script and you're rushing through like five different villains because you're trying to do the whole like you know sinister six type of thing but it you know they, again rush too much it just looks like way too much stuff's going on in, in, on the screen and they, like really nothing happens that's kind of how i feel like about the first story just overall you know, not even like again, not too much spoilers, but just overall, I kind of feel like that's what it is. There's too many villains, like major villains, and not enough time. Because there's only what, like 28 chapters, or so. Okay, so you do think he just winged it, basically? He didn't really put time to actually plan what was going to happen in advance, essentially. Yeah. And I was way off. There's actually 45 chapters, which I mean is doable. There are stories, or even shorter, that are like way, you know, written better with pacing, and characters, and all that. But this one, just again overall, I feel like they could have taken a little bit more time planning, and it would have been really good. But yeah, I mean, the chapter one pretty much sets it up as every Fallout 3 like playthrough. Or even Fallout 4 playthrough, except, oh, instead of, you know, a full vault in Fallout 4, you, you wake up to everyone dead, and you have to find your, your son. You know, in Fallout 3, it's like, oh, you know, there's like a weird um, malfunction going on, you got rad roaches, like, entering the vault, and uh, the guards are going crazy, they're killing people, and your dad ran out of the vault, and it's like, you have to find your dad. It's the same thing with Chapter 1. You know, we have an introduction to Velvet Remedy, which again, for I'm agreeing with Afterglow, um, as well as even what you said, like it just sets up like this weird relationship, like right off the bat. Like we get it, they knew each other as kids, but other than that, it's like, okay, like why, why is this, why is this person so important? Like you don't even go into any details. You just say, oh, I really like them because they're cool. Like that's basically what it is. And from there, right? And you guys can butt in whenever you want to. From there, we uh, get. Like, oh, here's my, um, my, uh, you know, uh, my pit buck. Here, repair it because I need repairs and stuff like that because I'm going to give a show and for whatever reason, I need to be wearing my pit buck in, in, the, in the stable. I mean, any character that has even a decent amount of perception would be like, huh, why are you like, you know, you, you don't need to take it off. Like, I can just fix it real quick right here. But she's oh, no, I'll, sp I'll spend the whole time on it. So, you know, kind of a little bit suspect there, but it is what it is. And then, Lord and behold, the next day, Valve Remedy's gone. Nobody knows where Valve Remedy's at. And everyone's freaking the hell out. And then, you know, typical, um, typical, like, anime thing. Like, everyone's talking, oh, I wonder what happened. I wonder what happened. And then the main character has that one thing that shows, like, they were the last person to speak to this character, which is the Pit Buck. And mm -hmm. people are like, oh, oh, sorry. I say people. See, K Kit Kat's rubbing off a little bit on me. Um, right. Oh, yeah, like all the all the all the stable dwellers and stuff like that are like all looking around, like, oh wait, is isn't that like her pit buck? Isn't that her? Pit? Like, why do you have her? And like the overmare, right? The overmare is that it's like for for once, like on little Piff's side, like neutrally on her side, like not so much as like, oh, I'm I'm gonna like help her out because I have a interest in helping her, but more like I don't want to have like a freaking riot on my, you know, in this little hallway or whatever. Is like, oh, take it and then you, like go go wherever. Um. And then, you know, skipping the whole, like, oh, my God, she betrayed us, and this and that, this and that. And then, like, you know, the, the all the passive aggressiveness aside, um, she gets out. She gets out. She sees the world. Um, of course, the typical, you know, radiation starts, you know, the, what is it? The Geiger counter. There you go. 
like it starts going off and then um you see the first landmark which is you know <laughs> what is it the whole like what's it called what's it called what's it called yeah you're right the first landmark applejack's farm <laughs> so already there you're like okay cool we're gonna be in in uh we're in a very familiar place, and that's pretty much like after that, she finds a terminal that's on, reads it, and starts exploring a little bit more, and then that's kind of like what sets up the, the the app, you know, everything afterwards. So it's it's again, it's every typical Fallout, you know, Bethesda type like formula. Something happens, a per a person that I love like escapes the vault, and I have to go find them. So. Afterglow, you have any thoughts? Or did I pretty much... Well, in the story's defense, the reason she takes Velvet Spitba is because she wants to give it the platinum drip. So she's simping. So most of uh, Little Pit's motivations for anything with Velvet is just simping. So, so you're going to tell me she goes through all these fucking nuclear horrors just a chance to get with her? I have fucking Little Pip is down bad in this story. Jesus so, fucking great Christ. Great character motivation. Why is this character do have all those characters biddings? Oh, they want to fuck. Yeah, creative writing. That's still barely any time in the state. I don't even know. I don't think, does the other mayor even get a name? I don't think so, actually. <laughs> I think it's literally just the over mayor. Yeah. That's how little they cared about setting up the actual vault. Can't even get the head of the entire facility a name. Exactly. No, that, that's why it's like, uh... <laughs> oh my god. I, you're right, like, I, I wish... I wish there was a story. <laughs> you know? That focused on that. Building up the stable. Setting up the stakes. What happens if this fails? What happens if that fails? Or this or that? And we'll have some more investment in the characters. After Go just nails it by saying, like, oh yeah, it's it's, it's basically a story about, like, simping and chasing after literal tail. And I'm assuming by the well, end, she's still motivated just to chase after her tail, right? Uh, yeah, not going into spoilers. For well, I think sake. the reason... I think the reason every Fallout quest in a story doesn't spend a lot of time on the stable, because like everybody hated how long the stable scene in Man Three was. It's like, oh man, I can have a long stable scene; everyone will hate it. Like Fallout Three. Hmm. Yeah. That's my I mean, it's just and kind of going off. Like we're done with the whole like chapter one thing. We're kind of like now just talking about, I guess, how would we write our own thing. Um. Just be, I guess you could just say, like, just be a little bit different. You know, maybe maybe write a story in a non-controlled stable. You know, like how all, you have all these inspirational things you can find from the actual game of, like, how horrible some of these vaults were. Exactly. Maybe make the fucking character come from one of the fucked up vaults where they were doing, like, the very, like, bad experiments to them. Which would then explain the motives for that character wanting to leave and, you know, go to this nightmarish place because it's debatably better than their fucking own vault or stable in the situation. Yeah, I mean, like, it's not that difficult to have a character, like, be pushed into this new world. I mean, it could just be that, right? Where it's like a draw, that the, the, the resources are, are so low that they have to, you know, push one of their own out, you know, into this you know, hole, let's just call it a hole in the ground, kind of like a this is Sparta moment, where they throw him into the hole, and from there, normally, the, every character dies, they wake up, right, because they, they're, they're, they're put unconscious after falling such a distance, and they see all these, like, bones and rotting, you know, flesh and this and that, and there it is, they have to find their way out, they see some light, end up finding, like, a cave system, you know, they explore the cave system a little bit more, and then they end up finding creatures in the cave, so they gotta, like, survive, and then, you know, from there, they, they eventually find their way out of the vault through, like, some, you know, underground caves, which have been done in other stories, of course. So, that would be interesting. Um, 
or have an explorer, you know, if if you really want to start your story in, in in a vault or stable, whatever, have an explorer, you know, like oh, we want to know what's out there, so you know we can only open the door, and you know, every couple of months or whatever, I don't know, have a good reason for it. Maybe it uses too much energy. Maybe it's like they're still afraid of the whole like effects, so they had to open it, have like a airlock in between it, and you know they want to know what happens, so they just send you out there. And then, like, have a twist of, oh, we didn't know we were going to survive. Like, we send, you know, explorers out all the time because, you know, da -da -da -da, maybe it's a punishment. Know. Maybe they send out, like, the quote unquote delinquents of the stable. So they're just sending out the ones that they really don't want to come back. Yeah. And that could maybe set up the story where this character has been, you know, considered dysfunctional, quote unquote. And now they've learned that they've basically been, like, left to die by their own fucking home. Exactly. Yeah, uh, really. The, the true way to start out leading to leave the vault is because the vault is running out of monster drinks. No monster, no vault. I'll drink to that. That's the one guy that got that reference. I'll drink to that. Yeah. But I mean, there, there's just so much ways where you can do that. And I think that should probably be a point where we can discuss the chapters a little bit more and say like okay what have you, what would have you done differently and i know it comes off as like monday morning quarterback but you know that's that's kind of like how i feel about a lot of these like parts of the story where it's like i would have done this instead of doing that i would have done this instead of doing that and this and that and this and that but i mean that's what that's what everything when it comes to like art and writing and stuff like that, you look at your your image and you're like, huh, I would have done this, I would have done that. But then it's it's you know, for some things it's it works, for other things, eh, depends. But um, any any closing thoughts or you guys want to talk about something else real quick or you guys are good? Um, what are kind of thoughts? I don't know, just anything you guys wanted to bring up. Just for the first, this is like the first intro. This is like a pilot episode to this to this review. Well, I can tell we're gonna have a very very positive time reviewing this with all the fucking flaws we've already pointed out in the last three minutes. Yeah. No, I mean it's. I have to take off those rose tinted those rose tinted glasses of nostalgia. I mean that's just with everything. It's not just this story, but I, you know, old video games, old books I read, old comics stuff, and this and that. I mean, even just situations in life. I look back at it, and it's like, huh, those weren't as good as they should have been. It's just I was in this spot in my life, so it was okay. But then as I get older, it's like that really wasn't okay, you know. So it's kind of like it's just one of those I think exercises that anyone can use when they're reviewing anything. You know, it kind of helps in that kind of stuff, but I'll get off my soapbox uh, after Glow. You like anything to say, or or you're good? We can just wrap this up. I also have my closing thoughts will be the same as they are every chapter. Don't read Fall to Quest here, read Private Party. <sighs> I mean, if you really want to read that 1.8 million word story, by all means, but yeah, <laughs> it does a little bit of you well to at least understand the quote-unquote source material by Kate Cat, even though I have my disagreements oh. on it. <laughs> Come on, it's only three times the length of Vanilla. Yeah. And we're going to be talking about things happening in Chapter 1, even though we're in Chapter 36. Let's go. Proud of Rise and Grind set. <sighs> Well, if that's all we're going to say, and that's all the thoughts that you guys want to share, this has been uh, Enclave, and I was joined by my co-host, Afterglow. God, I love my wife. God, he loves his wife, he says. And I was joined also by our one and only guest for right now, Smutty. All right. Rocks. Awesome. So this has been uh, put off for so long that let's just, you know, do it and see what happens. Gee, I hope the FOE thread likes us. <laughs> Probably not, but I look forward to those views. I look forward to those views and people saying, "Oh, why get get your freaking shilling out of here?" Even though every thread is asking for content and new stuff, but 
this and that, but as soon as you put a link, it, it's it's all ogre. Good morning. Okay. And if I don't see you, good evening and good night. <laughs>